So, many of you guys out there, if you kept up with this, kept up with me so far, are probably gonna notice something that, you know, DM, whenever you try to do an open world campaign, it really doesn't go your way. You should probably stop doing those. And the answer is, you know what, you are right. I should stop trying to do an open world campaign. So now I'm going to tell you about this new open world campaign that I'm doing right now. This new campaign I'm playing is set in the marvelous world of Genesis. What it is, is it's actually a rule set that gives you all the stuff you need to make whatever you want. And the rules that it uses is the Edge of the Empire Star Wars rules, which are now the Genesis rules. So if you want to do a steampunk setting, this, is, this has got your back. A fantasy setting? This has got your back. A space opera setting, this has got your back. Weird War, Modern Day, what have you. All of it is rounded up in this book. And this book, right now, is only going for about $40. $40? Wait, are you serious? I, 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 I can't believe that, that this is only $40. $40 for, like, unlimited amounts of play in one of the best role-playing systems of all time? That's got a, that's got, that's got a, what is a bet? $40? You're not giving the phone number for them to call to order it. Yeah, no. And um, we actually did something that I'd never done before, that I had actually heard you do with this game. We had a session zero. We came up with all this great stuff, like what kind of campaign is it going to be, how it's going to be, you know, who are the major players, and all this stuff. And it was great. So the gist of the campaign is is, is they are uh, essentially space truckers. That's, that's the idea of the campaign. Th think something like Elite Dangerous or Wing Commander Privateer. You know, like, I, I got this great universe all planned up for them, and, and, and they'll get together. And they want to be space truckers. Specifically, they want to be space trucker bounty hunters. You know, so like they, they do bounties, but they also, like, run cargo occasionally. And maybe maybe take the cargo of the bounties that they kill, you know. They get their first official mission, where they got to go get this, you know, get a bounty on a guy. Because I am terrible with names, his name was Frack. If you're asking, was there also a Frick? Yes, yes, there also is a Frick. He has not made an appearance yet. He will probably have his own video. I have a feeling on this. I'm like, okay, you you know this guy named Frack, and you know his like last known, last known associates, so what do you do? Because, you know, it's one of my open world games, so I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to tell him what to do. And they're actually surprised. They're like, yeah, we, 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 we check his last known location, and, you know, we, we ask around the area. A good idea. But they know that at one place that he that he used to bartends at, the uh, the the hot waitress that works there, like mysteriously stopped showing up around the same time that Frack stopped showing up for that job. So they're thinking, ah, you know, they're gonna investigate her. Doesn't take them long to find out. And I just kind of you know describe a generic sci-fi place. It's it's it's, it's not too terribly sci-fi on this planet because you know I'm trying to get like a Firefly vibe, where it's like, you know, some planets are like Old West, some planets are like super technocracy, and some planets are kind of somewhere in between. This was kind of somewhere in between, you know? So I just kind of just try a more modern type, you know, building. They're like, okay, and they just kind of start standing outside this building. Until finally one of them, the girl in the group, kind of goes up and says, she knocks on the door. And, you know, kind of hints at, hey, there's these creeps out here, can I come inside? And she's like, okay, so she lets her inside. And then, you know, she locks the door and, you know, they just kind of have, you know, girl talk. And the entire time, I'm like, do you do, you, do, you do anything while you're here? She's like, well, I, 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 I bring up Frack. And she's like, oh, no, I haven't seen Frack in days, you know. And I'm like, do you, do you do anything else? Trying to hint that she's making breakfast. And, you know, trying to hint that, hey, look at the table. Because, you know, it wasn't a... It wasn't a mission on L.A. Noir where you look at the tables. Oh, there's two places set. I thought you said you haven't seen this guy. Uh -huh, I caught you in a lie. She just keeps asking about Frack, and I'm, um, you know, eventually Frack overhears and, you know, tries to run away. Yeah. So, so I, I mentioned that she was making dinner. So she like grabs like her skillet full of bacon and like bashes the the girl, you know, and she starts hitting her with the frying pan, you know, and I cut the sky, you know, like she's covered in bacon and bacon grease and get hit with a frying pan. He, it's at this point in time, the guy who plays Sephiroth in, in, in the previous campaign, uh, mind you, kicks in the front door, comes running in, sees the girl bashing her with the frying pan. So he lay, he levels, levels her with the shotgun and just opens fire with a shotgun. Just wastes her with a shotgun. 
you know, about this point in time, you know, gunshots are heard. So Frack tries to, he, 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 he jumps out the back window and starts running. Now, one of the guys had gotten around to the back. So he sees him and he chases after him and he kind of runs up the fire escape. And, you know, and then he kind of chases after him with the fire escape. Pulls his gun out, fires, and shoots the man's leg completely off. And he goes falling off the front of this building because he got to the top of the building and he was running and then uh, and he fell off the top of the building. So, try to imagine this situation. You are neighbor of this girl. You go out your front door one day and you see a bunch of hooligan looking guys hanging out in front of your building. I did describe that the neighbor came out his front door, saw them, and then went back inside his house. And then mentioned that he tried to go out the back door into the alleyway, saw the guy that was waiting in the alleyway, closed his door, locked it, and got his shotgun to help protect himself. The next thing he knows, he hears his neighbor's door get kicked open, two shots go off, a shotgun blast go off, and the window breaks. A few seconds later, he hears another gunshot. And the people on, in that building sees a corpse fall off their building. <laughs> So their reaction is, grab the body, we're, we're going to turn in this bounty. And I'm like, okay. If you haven't figured out another mistake they made at this point in time, they didn't have a car. So I'm like, okay, how you guys do this? It's, oh, we'll, we'll just carry him back to the police station. I'm like, okay. You're in a residential area full of, you know, single unit apartment buildings. All of you are covered in blood. He is missing a leg. You're just going to carry him through this neighborhood? And you're like, oh, yeah. It's a good point. But at this point in time, the robot's like, because one of them's a robot, a reploid. Yes, it's a reference to Mega Man. Yeah. He's like, I know, we'll... We'll put him in this trash can, and you guys one of those wheeling trash cans out. So, you're just going to be four ass walking down the street covered in blood, wheeling a bloody trash can. I then describe to them how this looks to the neighbors. They're like, oh, that's a good point. So they decided that they were just going to leave, and they left the robot there. Yeah, the robot's name was Gino Starwindbilt. Yeah, Gino Starwindbilt, original name. The robot just kind of stands there because he's the only one not covered in blood for the police to show up. This was actually probably a good thing because I rule in this universe that all robots cannot lie to law enforcement guys. So... He was also the only one that when they registered to have access to the bounty board, he was the only one that actually registered himself as a bounty hunter. All the other ones called themselves something else. So, you know, this is probably their best idea. So after some intense growing from the cops, they finally learned out, okay, this is what was going on. Obviously, they had a few questions about, you know, the blatant murder of his girlfriend. But, you know, got off on a technicality. Because, you know, she, she did attack him with a frying pan. Now, you're thinking, ah, DM, that's just, that's just crazy happenstance. That was in the heat of the moment. Any, any role player could make that mistakes. <laughs> just wait. Because the very next session, literally the next day, they get a second bounty mission. Because one of them's like, I really want to kill something today. I'm like, all right, you go to the bounty board and you find a good kill mission. You got to find a, and, and kill a guy named Jason. Jason Starwind built version six. Be, because in this universe, the robot's last name is, 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 is who built them. I thought it was cool. Anyway, so he's kind of a brother to, you know, Gino Starwind Bill. So, of course, their first thought is, 
well, what if we just turn our robot in? He looks like him, right? I'm like, no, guys, he's he's different. He's a, you know, they're, 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 they're reploids. Think like Mega Man. Oh, okay, okay, okay. They find out that this guy is in, like, you know, the crappy slums part of town, which, you know, I, I need to take him to because clearly these guys cannot go into the upscale part of town. So I then, I then make a comment about how, uh, yeah, he's known to be with a girl. And when they go, get to the crappy part of town, they, they investigate this girl. And, like, and then someone's like, oh, yeah, and he points to a wall. And it just says Jenny 8675309. Because at the time in my head, I was having a conversation with myself of, wait, in the song 8675309, he mentions that he found the girl's number off a wall. So is she a sex worker? And that, that was on my mind. And, and so in this case, the girl was a sex worker. They call her up immediately, immediately and they're like, hey, do you know this guy? And she's like, no, and hangs up. They had the phone to Maeve and Maeve immediately calls on the same phone, mind you. He's like, hey, I'm looking for a good time. And she's like, okay, meet me at this address. If you're thinking... Wow, that's a blatant trap. I bet they didn't fall for it. You're half right. They go there, and it's, it's, it's out in front of this convenience store. Maeve waits outside, because he's the John, so so Gino and Seth go inside. I mentioned how this big, you know, tough gang-looking guy came up. And was like, Maeve, you the guy waiting for Jenny? He's like, yes. Yes, I am. You know? Because subtly doesn't exist. So I have that. So I mentioned that that guy pulls a gun on him, you know, and like they start in a firefight out there. Meanwhile, on the inside, you know, the reploid behind the counter pulls out a gun and starts firing at Seth, because you know, he sees another Starwind built robot, and you know, this gang's got a few Starwind built robots in it, so he thinks he's part of the gang or something. They finish this fight, and then they're like, "Quickly, we have to get the security cam footage." Why? So they won't know we, we were here. Why would you want that? Well, because we just killed the cashier. So, so, so they break into the back and they steal the and they steal the, the camera footage because you know why not? You know, I figured it was you know going to be a situation of you know well well we killed these guys we might as well rob them. No, wasn't like that at all. They just went in the back, took the camera footage, and left. You know, Seth's off, Seth gets up and goes to get a slushy. You know, of course, he, he, you know, is totally being a dick by using one of the child size cups. You know, the size of an average child. Which is, which is for drinks only, not for slushies. That he's filling up with his slushy mix, you know. You know, like, that was his, that theoretically was his only crime at this point in time. Because the guy clearly pulls out a shotgun and opened fires first. You know, they eventually find out Jenny's location. They know she's on the fifth floor of a certain uh, apartment building. And um, so they go in there and they go up to the fifth floor. And I described that there are four doors. Or it might have been five doors. I, I forget, you know, like the thing downstairs didn't say which, which building she was in. And even if it did, you know, like the numbers are not really there. So, you know, you guys got to decide because I, you know, don't want to make this easy for them. Maeve um, goes in and just kind of, you know, opens up one door and just kind of lo looks around. In session zero, they said, you know, they didn't want it to be a serious campaign. So fine. So I pull a Back to the Future joke. Okay, Maeve, when you look into the room, you kind of look around and you're suddenly greeted with the barrel of a shotgun. And I described that there's that there's a man sitting there in his underwear wearing wearing a bulletproof vest, bandolier shotgun rounds, and he's got a bald head. And he's like, so you're the son of a bitch that's been stealing my newspaper. You got precisely 10 seconds to get off my door with your nuts intact. So he kind of basically kind of has the shotgun trained on him until he goes out of sight. Because who doesn't like a Mr. Strickland joke? I think they had gone to the other rooms and figured out nobody was in those rooms and figured out, so this must be the one. So Seth pulls his shotgun out, his double barrel shotgun, which is different from his other shotgun, and just both barrels into the door. 
Meanwhile, Gino goes rushing in to, to, to Jenny's room, looks over, sees Jenny, sees Jason, and runs up and starts get, getting in a fist fight with this guy. Which was kind of weird. I don't, know, I don't know why he was doing that. They all had perfectly good guns. He had a perfectly good Uzi, but whatever. So Seth comes walking into the room through his cloud of door, sees Jenny, gives her both barrels. Turns over, sees that uh, Gino can't quite get Jason down, so he gives Jason a barrel. Jason flies out the window. Are we noticing a pattern here? <laughs> Two missions back to back, their, their strategy has apparently been break the door down, shotgun the girlfriend, throw the guy off the roof. It'd be really weird Dog the Bounty Hunter episode. That'd be an amazing Dog the Bounty Hunter episode. They've got a strategy. Kick the door down, shotgun the girlfriend, throw him off the building. It's it. it works, it works. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so that's all I got. That's all I got on that one right now. <laughs> I'm embracing the madness and I'm loving it. <laughs> oh, God. So I guess uh, I guess the moral of the story is is you know don't get a bounty. And if you get a bounty, don't don't hang up with your girlfriend because they will find her. They will, they will shotgun her, and they will throw you off a building. So, let's just end this long-winded rant by saying, Good night, Night Vale. Good night. That is something that would happen in Night Vale. <laughs> the so, secret police. Oh, yeah. The sheriff's secret police. Which were the which originally were the police, but they but they were too public, so they became the secret police. Mm -hmm. And you know, those guys that held together out back of the Ralphs. Come, cuddle with us. <laughs>